Coming up, I want to talk about some important developments in the news, the um, protests on campus. I also want to talk about some revelations that have come out of the Jack Smith uh, case in Florida, things that Jack Smith wanted to conceal. And finally, a new indictment in Arizona against Republicans, uh, again, for supposedly conspiring to overturn in that state the results of the 2020 election. And evolutionary biologist Colin Wright joins me. We're going to talk about some really interesting topics, what we know and don't know about evolution, but also whether evolution is compatible with belief in a creator God. Uh, hey, if you're watching on Rumble or listening on Apple, Google, or Spotify, please subscribe to my channel. This is the Dinesh D'Souza Show. America needs this voice. The times are crazy. In a time of confusion, division, and lies, we need a brave voice of reason, understanding, and truth. This is the Dinesh D'Souza Podcast. Uh, today's podcast is um, a bit of a special edition because I invited the evolutionary biologist Colin Wright to come on the podcast to talk about um, evolution and um, God and morality. So this is a topic that has been um, kicked off um, on X, I think Tucker Carlson made some sardonic, uh, maybe disbelieving comments about evolution that's caused a lot of people to weigh in. And I thought, well, let's bring on a scientist. And in fact, a scientist who has uh, different views than, than I do, a scientist approaching this from a naturalistic or atheist point of view to discuss with me the um, what is known and what is not known about this issue and how we can, how we can intelligently think about it. What I want to do in the um, in my opening segment here is cover uh, three separate topics that I'm going to cover just briefly. The first one I've been thinking about this um, these anti-Semitic uh, activists on campus and try to think to myself who is who is putting them up to it? Who is really to blame here? Is it the students? I saw an interesting uh, video of a student uh, at NYU. And she seemed to be a, an NYU student, but when she was um, probed about it, she was quite obvious that she was not. She, I think she was a Columbia student, and she had come over to NYU because she had heard, oh, the protests are intensifying at NYU. And the interviewer was asking her, um, like, what, um, what do you want uh, Israel to do? And she's like, I don't really know. And then uh, seizing his opportunity, well, what are you then protesting about? What is this protest for? And she's like, I, I don't really know. And then she turns to her friend. She goes, what are we, what are we protesting? Uh, and, you know, I think that there's a lot more of this than we, than we think. Because we hear these students, and sometimes they say, uh, they robotically say, from the river to the sea. Uh, or, you know, we need 100 October 7s. Um, and we think, oh, my gosh, uh, these students have just, um, you know, thrown in with the terrorists. I guess the point I'm trying to make is I think a lot of it is these are ideas implanted uh, in these students by their professors. So the, 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 the real culprits, the instigators, are the professors, not the students. Now, this is a little counterintuitive because the students all think that they are independent thinkers. They're making up their own mind. They're, they're not being indoctrinated or brainwashed. But if you think about students, particularly on elite campuses, one of the things they want most to do is to conform. They want most to be thought of as intelligent, as smart, uh, and they use their professors as the models of intelligence. Uh, and this is, of course, encouraged in the classroom. Your professor is going to help you think about a particular topic. What do I think about um, this math problem? Or what do I think about Hamlet? And so students become... Um, a, a, um, become imitators, if you will, of the uh, not only the mode of thinking and talking and perhaps even dressing, but also the they absorb the ideological convictions and prejudices of their teachers. So that's the first point I want to make. 
I also want to talk about um, the Jack Smith case because in the Jack Smith case in Florida, this is on the classified documents, for a long time, Jack Smith has been trying to block uh, access to information. He doesn't want things to be revealed in discovery. And this has been a source of tension between him and the judge, Eileen Cannon. And finally, the judge says, no, you got you to gotta reveal these materials. And the materials are now coming out. <laughs> and now we see why Jack Smith wanted to hide them. So I want to highlight four important findings that have come out from these materials. One. The National Archives was working hand in hand with the Biden White House. There were constant communication back and forth between them about bringing charges against Trump. In other words, this was a collusion between the, the people at the archives who hated Trump and the incoming Biden administration. How do we get this guy? Number two, when Attorney General Merrick Garland said that that this was a an independent investigation, that this was not did not involve the White House, did not involve this was the Justice Department appointed a special counsel to go out on his own and look at this. No, the Biden White House was looped in from the beginning. Uh, they were part of the deliberations. They were part of the consultations, and this is something that Jack Smith was very eager to conceal. Three. Uh, Biden's DOJ instructed the National Archives about how to cover up the coordination. In other words, they were, there was an effort to, su to, to suggest to the archives, let's not put all this stuff out there. Uh, yes, we are collaborating, but let's kind of keep that on the down low. And four, the Department of Energy, this is Biden's Department of Energy, discovered that Trump had an active security clearance even after he was indicted. And so they retroactively terminated it. Think about this. They realized Trump still has a clearance. So in other words, he is authorized to have access to all this information. But if we're going to criminally charge him, we, we have to act like he didn't. And so they went and retroactively ended Trump's access. So now they could say that in the period after Trump left the White House, he was his access to this information was unauthorized. He should not have had access to this classified information. So I think this is all very incriminating and also helpful to, helpful to Trump. I also want to talk briefly about something that's just, that's new, and that is that a new indictment has come down in Arizona against a whole bunch of Trump attorneys as well as a prominent Republican figures in Arizona, and they are being charged with um, conspiracy uh, to um, um, challenge the 2020 election in Arizona. They're supposedly uh, guilty of fraud. They're supposedly guilty of trying to overturn the election in Arizona. And as far as I can tell, all of this is based on a quite nonsensical premise. Now, who are we talking about? Who are the people indicted? One is a friend of mine, Kelly Ward, former chairman of the Arizona Republican Party. Another guy I know, Tyler Boyer. He's with Turning Point Action, um, uh, kind of a sidekick of Charlie Kirk at Turning Point. Uh, there are a number of Trump attorneys and recognizable figures, Mark Meadows, Rudy Giuliani, Jenna Ellis, John Eastman, Christina Bob, Trump's attorney, uh, Mike Roman, so the idea here is what, what do these people actually do? How do they, what is their conspiracy? What, what do they do? Well, supposedly what they did is they had a group of, quote, fake electors, except there's nothing fake about it. Um, in other words, the Republicans said Arizona is being challenged. The outcome in Arizona is disputed. Now, when an election is disputed, you can't just take it to, uh, you cannot just go through the process and then if you win later, say, okay, now it's time for us to put some electors together. You are required to have those electors already in place who have, the electors have to create a record of their existence. And then if you win your case, those electors become the actual electors. Now, this group of people in Arizona were following a precedent that was set up in 1960 uh, in the Kennedy-JFK-Nixon uh, election. 
what happened in that election was Hawaii was really closely contested and it was being disputed. Um, and, um, um, and Nixon had, was said to have won Hawaii very narrowly, but it was so close and a recount was underway. And so Democrats assembled their own electors. They submitted their votes to D.C. to be counted while the state worked out the contest in the courts. And, and the most important point is it actually worked. Uh, the recount showed that Kennedy won the state of Hawaii by just 150 votes. <coughs> so it was Kennedy, not Nixon. And so the state's governor retracted the Nixon certification, submitted a new one in favor of Kennedy. But the point is that the Kennedy votes were only counted because the Kennedy electors were already in place beforehand, before the courts had ruled. So the, the guys in Arizona knew this, and they're like, look, we are going to put together a slate of electors, and we're not doing this secretly, conspiratorially. They put out a press release saying, we're doing this, and we're doing this to preserve a record. And yet now, Chris Mays, the attorney general in Arizona, has indicted them. So what is this? It is lawfare. It is essentially criminalizing political differences. By the way, Chris Mays himself, um, Chris Mays herself might have won her election by fraud. She was, by the way, elected by just 280 votes. And there were many other uncounted votes that the Republicans wanted to be counted. Chris Mays went to court essentially to block or thwart the effort to have those votes counted. So you've got this dubiously elected attorney general now going after prominent figures in the Republican Party. It's kind of a way of showing you that this lawfare is not confined to Trump. It sweeps across. It's not just Trump. It's not just January 6th. It's not just people now who pray at abortion clinics. Uh, but it's also Republican legislators around the country. So Republicans better realize that this is a dirty game that the Democrats are playing. Uh, and if you want to be, uh, if you, you if you don't want to be constantly victimized by this kind of thing, which could happen to anyone, could happen to you, could happen to me, then we've got to realize that we need effective ways to fight back. And there's no more effective way to fight back than to recognize that we need to hold these guys to account. Uh, we need to start doing some of the same stuff that they are doing to us, to them. Debbie and I were taking a look at our gold portfolio and hey, looking very good. There's a very common sense reason, well, reasons why gold is pushing right now to all time highs. Number one, inflation. The cost of goods continues to rise despite interest rate controls by the Fed. Since January 2021, cost of living is up 17.9%. Number two. The national debt, out of control, continues to skyrocket. Now over $34 trillion causes a lot of people to wonder, when is this house of cards going to come crashing down? And three, a presidential election. So much uncertainty and turbulence, massive implications for the future of the country. So all of this is adding up to instability, to uncertainty. And this is why a lot of Americans are turning to gold and specifically to Birch Gold Group. Have you diversified your savings yet? Secure a portion of them with gold from Birch Gold like Debbie and I have. Text Dinesh to 989898. Get your free information kit. You'll learn how to convert an existing IRA or 401k into a tax-sheltered IRA in gold. And it doesn't cost you a penny out of pocket. Birch Gold has an A-plus rating with a Better Business Bureau, tens of thousands of happy customers. You can can count on Birch Gold too. Just text Dinesh to 989898. Claim your free information kit and protect your savings from uncertainty today. You might have heard Mike Lindell and My Pillow no longer have the support of their box stores or shopping channels the way they used to. They've been part of this horrible cancel culture, but they want to pass the savings directly on to you by having a $25 extravaganza. Now, when Mike started My Pillow, it was just a one product company. I mean, just the pillow. But now, with the help of his dedicated employees, Mike has hundreds of products, some of which you may not even know about. So to get the word out, I want to invite my viewers and listeners to check out their $25 extravaganza. Two-pack multi-use MyPillows, $25. MyPillow sandals, $25. Six-pack towel sets, $25. Brand new four-pack dish towels, you guessed it. Just $25. And for the first time ever, the premium my pillows with all new Giza fabric, just $25. By the way, orders over $75 get free shipping as well. Now, this amazing offer won't last long. Take advantage. 
Call 800-876-0227. The number again, 800-876-0227. Or go to MyPillow.com to get the discounts, to get the free shipping. You need to use the promo code D-I-N-E-S-H Dinesh. Guys, I'd like to welcome back to the podcast Dr. Colin Wright. He is an evolutionary biologist who got his PhD in biology from UC Santa Barbara in 2018. He's a fellow at the Manhattan Institute. Uh, He's been writing a good bit about the biological differences between men and women. His articles have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, New York Post, Newsweek. He's also been a guest on some big podcasts, Joe Rogan, Tucker Carlson, Trigonometry, Tim Cast, and so on. His uh, website, drcolinwright.com. And you can follow him on X at swipe right, W-R-I-G-H-T. Uh, hey, Colin, welcome. Thanks for joining me. I appreciate it. Uh, we're actually here not to talk about a topic you've been talking about a lot, which is biological differences between the sexes. But we want to talk today about the issue of evolution. Now, this is not normally a topic kind of in the current news, but it has exploded on X. And I don't know if it was because of some skeptical comments about evolution that Tucker Carlson made, but in any event, you've got people posting about the subject. Um, And I thought it'd be interesting to probe it uh, and probe it from the point of view uh, of people who still have anxieties, concerns, objections to evolution that I think in the end are not rooted so much in science as they are rooted in uh, theological concerns, moral concerns, and this is what I want to uh, to talk to you about. But let's begin. Um, people sometimes will say of evolution, hey, it's a theory. And in common parlance, when people talk about a theory, they mean like it's a speculation. Like I got a theory about why you, you know, always wear the same shirt every time I see you. Um, and uh, but that is not what the term theory means uh, in science. Uh, so can you start by clarifying what in science is meant by a theory? Yeah, I think that's a, a good place to start because, uh, as you mentioned, there is sort of this common way that we talk about theories is very colloquial um, in our everyday speech. But when we're talking about theories in science, it's not just like a hunch. It's not merely a hypothesis or an educated guess. It really is this this well-tested system of interconnected facts that explains uh, a bunch of different lines of evidence in a way that sort of builds a a huge case for, uh, for something being true. You can also look at it in terms of differentiating theories from facts themselves. You can have like observations of the universe uh, of different facts. And then theories are also ways to sort of combine all these facts into a framework to explain something in a mechanistic sense. So we have, you know, for instance, the fact of gravity, that things of massive objects pull each other towards one another. But then when we talk about gravitational theory, we're talking about, you know, bent space time that can explain all these observations uh, that we're making out there. So evolution is similar in that there's there's a fact component of that life forms have changed through time uh, that is, you can see, uh, you know, through biogeography, the fossil record, uh, DNA sequences. And then there's sort of the the evolutionary theory, which is, which asks, how did this happen? How did this occur? And then we have ideas of, you know, genetics and mutation and selection and so on. So I think that's a good way to split, uh, split it up. W- would you agree, Colin, that when we use the term theory in science, uh, there are theories that are more or less accepted and valid. And I say this because if we look, for example, at the world of physics, you have, you know, New- Newton's theory of gravitation, of course, was as close to a true theory uh, as uh, could be imagined at the time. And in fact, the whole Industrial Revolution was kind of based upon an application of precisely uh, those theories of Newtonian mechanics and so on. But if I use the term theory of relativity, and then I use the term string theory, uh, it it seems to me that the theory of relativity, Einstein's theory, has huge amounts of support, uh, confirmation, testing. Um, But string theory, on the other hand, while it is a theory and it is an attempt to explain facts, 
is far more tentative, more speculative, less well-established. So would you agree with that distinction? And second of all, of those, where does evolution fit in terms of the degree of confidence that you as a biologist would have in it? Yeah, yeah. So I think a lot of people, a lot of people in the scientific community are upset with string theorists because it's, I think it's more of a catchy term that they use for their idea, which a lot of even physicists, I know Lawrence Krauss believes that they should still be calling it the string hypothesis because it, it doesn't have that level of empirical support that we have for other things like the germ theory of disease, uh, evolution uh, by natural selection, and things like uh, general relativity where we you know it's been verified by looking at the way that uh, light bends coming uh, across gravitational bodies things like that um and i i'd also say that what newton did i wouldn't really call what he did a, a theory either that's would be more in, in terms of just establishing a law which is sort of observing relationships between uh, certain phenomena and sort of putting it down into a, a theorem basically uh, but he didn't really have an idea of of why sort of the mechanistic uh, uh, underpinnings of these phenomena. He just sort of wrote down the relationship that he observed. Uh, I think evolution sits very high among uh, things like general relativity and the germ theory of disease. Uh, just given the the number of lines of evidence that are mutually corroborating uh, that you know didn't have to be true, and how subsequent discoveries of the genome uh, have all just you know fit right into this framework nice and snug uh, in ways that you know they didn't have to be if, if evolution wasn't true so um yeah i think that there's plenty of evidence that evolution uh is a fact in the in the sense that it occurs life forms have changed over time but certainly there's a lot to still explore about you know the nature of where mutations are coming from uh the nature of selection the directions of selection uh how strong it can be at different times and we don't claim to know everything about the mechanisms for evolution. Uh, that's still, you know, a, a vibrant area of research in, in the sciences. I want to ask you what you think is the, if you had to give in, in layman's terms, the single argument that is strongest for evolution. Well, I mean, I'll kind of give you mine uh, and have you sort of react to it and then also kind of give you give your own. Um, and mine is just this, that fossils can, can by and large be quite accurately dated. Uh, and uh, according to evolution, there has been a sort of a kind of a, a movement, if you will, through time from uh, single celled organisms to multicellular organisms, in a sense, a development toward greater complexity, obviously later consciousness forms of life and then human beings being uh, latecomers in evolution and in fact um, more complex in terms of awareness of evolution awareness of the world and, and and so on so this is the evolutionary let's call it story uh, and if you took all the fossils in the world and laid them on a very large table you would actually observe this development from single cell to multicellular or organisms and then the question arises are there fossils out of place? In other words, if you could find, for example, the fossil of a mammal that existed uh, and can be dated to the same time as the dinosaurs, then kaboom, that would be the end of evolution because it would be a decisive refutation of the entire evolutionary pattern. Uh, and yet we don't have any such, quote, refutation. So to me, that is a pretty convincing account that in fact this development did take place in this way. Um, what do you think of that idea? And also, um, what would be your um, kind of knockdown single step uh, argument for why you really can't disbelieve, at least flat out, in evolution? Yeah, I think what you brought up is definitely a major, uh, a major point if it can be just one point in favor of evolution, uh, that sort of nested hierarchy that you're mentioning of of relationships and how, uh, you know, the life forms start simple, they get more complex. Uh, and, and it really, when you when you step back, it forms what we can see at a more short term, uh, short term level as as a family tree, you know, we, we see our families, we have parents, grandparents, and that forms a sort of nested hierarchy. And when you zoom out even more, we can look at species 
in the same way. So that's, I think, a, a tremendous amount of evidence for evolution. Um, it's hard to say, like, which, what is the one knockdown? Because the strength is through mutually corroborated lines of independent evidence, that being one of them. Another being, I think, uh, the fact that we looked at, you know, mapped so many genomes and have found that the the informational uh, aspect of evolutionary biology, how this information is stored from one generation to the next. And looking at these genomes, uh, you can statistically create these family trees as well. And this didn't have to be the case. We didn't know uh, what what genomes uh, were composed of, you know, for for that long. Darwin had no idea what genes were. Um, and it just so happened to fit perfectly within uh, the evolutionary framework. And then there's other lines such as uh, evidence from biogeography, just the distribution of animals on the planet. Uh, and, you know, we can get into you know, sort of volcanic islands versus continental islands. And, you know, there's just there's just so many different lines of evidence we could talk about uh, for evolution. So uh, they're really all mutually reinforcing. And I think taking all of them uh, at the same time really makes the case that it's uh, evolution is very, I think, pretty impossible to deny if you're looking at it soberly. When we come back, let's explore um, some questions about what evolution perhaps does not explain or does not even try to explain uh, and then i want to get into the to me the heart of the matter which is the compatibility of evolution with people's sort of foundational ideas about god and and about morality guys if you'd like to support my work i'd like to invite you to check out my locals channel where you can become an annual or a monthly subscriber I post a lot of exclusive content there, including content that's censored on other social media platforms. On Locals, you get Dinesh Unchained, Dinesh Uncensored. You can also interact with me directly. I do a live weekly Q&A every Tuesday. No topic is off limits. I've also got a movie page up on Locals, and I've uploaded some very cool films up there, documentaries, feature films. 2000 Meals is up there, and also the new, uh, the latest film, Police State. Uh, if you're an annual subscriber, you can stream and watch this movie content for free. It's included in your subscription. So check out my channel. It's Dinesh.Locals.com. I'd love to have you along for this great ride. Again, it's Dinesh.Locals.com. I'm back with uh, evolutionary biologist Dr. Colin Wright, a fellow at the Manhattan Institute. Follow him on X at Swipe Wright, uh, W-R-I-G-H-T. We're talking about uh, evolution. Uh, and Colin, let me... Um, let me raise with you three things that, in at least in my view, evolution does not explain. I'm not even sure it tries to explain these things, but um, but I want to see if you agree with me that evolution doesn't really get there. The first one, of course, is the the origin of life. In other words, that evolution is not trying to account for how we got life at all. Uh, Darwin begins with life forms, and evolution is really an explanation of how life forms are transformed the one to the other, but it doesn't uh, attempt to explain the starting point. Number two, um, the uh, consciousness. And by consciousness, what I mean is that we, we are material beings uh, made up of, you know, neurons and cells and, 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 um, and so on. And yet we seem to have this other thing uh, that is not objective, but is subjective. And in fact, it's very sort of difficult to account for in purely material terms because it, it, we don't experience it in a material way. The, our awareness of the world. And the third, um, uh, the third phenomenon I want you to comment on is simply morality. And by morality, what I mean, I don't just mean human kind of cooperative ventures or, or kind of tit for tat ventures where you help me out, I'll help you out. I'm actually just talking about the moral voice inside of us where when we want to do something, somehow seems to say internally, don't do that, you know? And this moral voice is, I mean, pretty much every human being has it, right? If you don't have it, we call you a sociopath or a psychopath. Um, and it is very authoritative. Uh, it is very real because it's hard to imagine uh, life without it. Uh, and yet to me, it doesn't fit neatly inside the evolutionary framework. So I'd like you to just comment on, uh, on your thoughts about evolution and the beginning of life, evolution and consciousness, 
and then evolution and human morality. Yeah, those are great big topics to <laughs> dive into. Thank you. Um, I, I think there is a slight difference among some of those. So as you mentioned, the beginning of life, what scientists might call the field of abiogenesis, the creation of life from non-life, you're correct. That is not something that evolutionary biology uh, is concerned with. I mean, I would like to know how it happened. It's a very interesting topic to many evolutionary biologists, but it is not in the purview of evolutionary biology specifically. That's a whole other branch of chemistry, and uh, there's interesting ideas going over there, but we, we don't know uh, how life started, and it's it, it might be impossible to know how it actually happened because it happened uh, once on Earth a very, very long time ago. Um, so even if we were to recreate it, there's no saying that that's the way it happened in the lab uh, in, in, in the world uh, four and a half billion years ago or three and a half for, for life. Um, the other two, consciousness and morality, it's not so much that um, evolution isn't concerned with these, they're outside the purview. They're just, I would say, big mysteries of evolution. We we don't understand how they came about. Um, given, you know, for consciousness, it is such a complex emergent property of uh, you know, billions of neurons in a brain. Um, it's hard to measure in the levels of consciousness in other creatures, even our closest common ancestors. Um, it, it, so it's, it's really hard to create a really robust evolutionary framework um, looking at variation in consciousness because it's it's just something that's almost impenetrable to measure and test. Um, that's not to say that it's not compatible, that it couldn't have potentially evolved. I think um, there probably is different levels of uh, conscious experience for different animals, um, but it's just something we're, we don't, we're not privy to. We can't peek into the brains of other animals. In, in a rigorous way to to really test it. So it could, you know, continue as being this area of ongoing research where, where we're not making a whole lot of progress because it's just such a difficult, difficult question. Um, and then similar for morality, I think there's good evidence that other animals, uh, our closest ancestors, chimps and things, have sort of rudimentary ideas of right and wrong. Uh, the anthropologist Franz de Waal did a lot of these sort of experiments. Um, and, you know, it's it's impossible to say whether they have sort of this internal moral voice, as you talked about, saying, don't do this, this is wrong, you know, you're, you're, this is your brother, why would you deprive them of food or something like that? Um, but I, I don't think that morality is something that evolution uh, can't explain in principle and that we uh, it, it necessarily must be explained through some outside uh, supernatural entity or something like that. So, yeah, there's certain things that are outside the purview of evolution, and there's just certain things that are just extremely complex that we don't really understand too well. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that evolution, uh, that, that they didn't evolve or that we won't ever have more information about about these certain topics. Yeah, I mean, I think with regard to to morality, what I'm getting at is just this, that the the underlying driver of evolution, as I understand it, uh, is essentially uh, self-perpetuation or survival, right? In other words, uh, this was the thesis uh, uh, with some with some uh, modification in, in uh, Dawkins as the selfish gene. The gene wants to sort of make copies of itself and, and perpetuate itself and multiply. And so self-interest uh, in that sense is a driving force of evolution. Uh, and even in evolutionary attempts to talk about morality, they by and large devolve back into self-interest. In other words, the, you know, the, how, how do you explain the fact that the mom ran into the burning car, you know, to save her children? Well, the answer is her children share her genes. Um, and, um, and so um, we are uh, driven to help others in part because of things that, you know, partly they might be related to us, but the other reason is if I help you, uh, you might help me later. In other words, it's like the business guy who says, I got to be nice to my customers, not because I'm a really nice guy, but I certainly want the guy to come back. Uh, and so the morality here is seen as a extension of, of, of self-interest, at least in the broadest sense. But I guess what it's what I'm saying is that there are there is a good deal of morality that isn't like that. Um, it 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 is there's no self interest involved, uh, and yet there's a little voice that's kind of telling you to do that. So let's say I'm I'm walking on the river bank and I see a little girl screaming in the pond and she's drowning, right? And I'm a horrible swimmer, so it's not in my interest to jump in. She's nothing to me. I don't know her from Adam, 
And yet, on the other hand, let's just say I don't. I just keep walking, uh, and I'm not obliged to jump in, of course, or you know, legally or something. But nevertheless, I I'm going to feel really bad. I'm going to think about that all day. And a little voice inside of me was like, you know, Dinesh, you really should have done more. You, maybe you shouldn't have jumped in, but you should have, you know, put out a stick and tried to pull her to the to the. So, and this is unavoidable. I mean, this is how we are wired. Uh, so, uh, what I'm getting at is, do you agree that there it seems to be as aspects of morality that flagrantly violate the idea of self-interest. And, and so I'm not saying there's no physical explanation for them. It just, to me, doesn't sit all that comfortably with the idea of evolution based upon natural selection and self-interest. Yeah, I, I, I get what you're saying. And I, I agree that there are certain aspects like the one you highlighted of, you know, why would you sacrifice yourself to save a perfectly, you know, distant stranger that likely doesn't share many genes with you? Um, you know, there are c certain ways that evolutionary biologists try to explain these things. You know, there's, there's sort of the, um, I, I know Richard Dawkins has brought up this could be sort of a misfiring because in our uh, the the history when we were lived in small community tribes, anyone you run into is more likely to have a higher proportion of your genes than uh, than than somebody else. So we just sort of have this algorithm that uh, you know encourages you to save those that are near you, even if uh, you know in reality they don't share these genes with you. Um, you know, and, and you you brought up sort of Hamilton's rule about we. Uh, are interested in, in in saving our offspring and a little less so our cousins and a little less so our more distant cousins um, because of the types of genes that we share with them. I think these are powerful mo models, especially when we're looking at behavior of animals and they can sort of explain how the thing, how the process sort of gets in motion, how it begins, uh, sort of how, how it primes the pump for the evolution of, of moral sentiment. Um, but I, I don't think that necessarily you can distill everything down to Hamilton's rule um, in the sort of this autistic literal sense of, of this is all that there is. Um, evolution and consciousness, it, they're incredibly complex things. And I would say that we need to leave the door open to finding more mechanisms that are explaining these complex traits, especially something as complex as morality. Um, I don't necessarily think that we need to all agree that there are certainly truly altruistic traits. It could be the case that there is some evolutionary motive that is at its root somewhat selfish. Um, but I, I don't know if that's necessary or not. I just think we need to sort of wait for the evidence to come in. I mean, it, I don't think it should change the way that we behave in the world uh, based on whether or not it turns out that it's true that saving that little girl is rooted some degree in a selfish motive. Um, I think we should probably still just behave as we as we would and, and trust our moral sentiments, uh, you know, as, as we go along. We'll be back for a final segment with Dr. Colin Wright. And I want to talk specifically about evolution, God and the Bible. I'm back with evolutionary biologist, Dr. Colin Wright, a fellow at the Manhattan Institute. Follow him on X at Swipe Right. By the way, the website, Dr. Dr. Colin Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T dot com. We're talking about evolution. Uh, and I want to turn, uh, Colin, to the topic of uh, evolution, God, and and the Bible. Uh, you put out, a, a, I think, a very provocative and interesting tweet where you said, uh, that evolution is not incompatible with theism or with a belief in God, but as you see it, it is incompatible with the story of Adam and Eve. It is incompatible with, with Noah's Ark. Now, there's kind of a lot here, so let's take it in parts. Let's start with the compatibility of evolution and theism. Uh, I think it's interesting you say this, and I think here you are in full agreement with Darwin himself, because although Darwin in later life, we will at times he called himself an agnostic, um, uh, I think perhaps Darwin was an atheist. But interestingly, uh, I've read a few biographies of Darwin. It doesn't look like his atheism came out of evolution. 
It looks like it came out of other reasons. He lost uh, a daughter uh, at a vulnerable age. Uh, I think he looked around at a bunch of his friends. At one point, he makes an offhand comment saying something like, you know, the people that I've been hanging out with are really nice people. They're wonderful people. And yet, if Christianity is true, most, if not all of them, are going to hell. And then Darwin goes, I can't accept a theology that would send essentially my best friends uh, into the flames. So Darwin was an interesting character, but, but um, it seems to me that Darwin was, did not believe that evolution was a kind of refutation uh, of theism. So talk if, for a moment, if you will, about why you say evolution is, is compatible with theism. As you know, there are both evolutionary biologists on the one side, people like Dawkins perhaps, and on the other side, there are Christians who would both flatly say that evolution and theism are incompatible. You've got to pick one or the other. You can't have both. I would say it, it entirely depends on what you, your definition of theism and the specific beliefs that are entailed within your theism. So there's plenty of people who are, call themselves Christians, um, who, who are definitely believing in the stories of Jesus and things like that, who would say that, um, you know, they fully accept evolutionary biology. They think that their concept of God is one where, well, maybe God started the first uh, you know, breath of life, um, wh whether it was that single-celled organism uh, back in the Precambrian, uh, got life started, that type of thing. And then they can accept evolution, as it said in the science textbooks and things like that. Like, if, if that's your version of Christianity and your vision of God, then yeah, the evolution certainly does not conflict with that uh, system of belief. But if your version of theism entails um, sort of this really strict, literal interpretation of a lot of biblical stories, such as Adam and Eve, you know, that basically uh, life started as special creation, every organism was in their current form, humans didn't have any precursors, uh, they didn't evolve from, uh, from, from other apes and other organisms, for instance, then yeah, there are certain claims that overtly tread on, on uh, evolution and that are completely incompatible with the belief. So if you're of the latter type of Christian, then yeah, evolution does pose a threat to your worldview if your worldview requires you to believe stories like Adam and Eve and Noah's Ark. But if your version of Christianity isn't so literally focused on those stories and imp interprets them in ways that I think benefits religion and science both, um, you know, that it, it's sort of the meaning behind these stories, the allegory, the symbols that they communicate, um, then there's really no conflict. I, I think we, we can, you can accept uh, these stories for what I think they are and the value that is truly there. And you can also be uh, fully in line with, with the way modern science views uh, the relationship between humans and the rest of the animal kingdom. You, you stated a, a kind of view of Christianity, um, which actually I, I don't hold myself. Um, in other words, the idea that of God as sort of the guy who put things in motion, almost a sort of a, you know, a deist conception of, of, of God. Well, let me give you kind of my own conception um, and, and see where the incompatibility of any arises. Because it looks, it seems to me that when I look at the, at the, at the world of physics, for example, the Big Bang, let's just say, the universe had a beginning five billion, you know, roughly years ago. Um, uh, and um, I, I say to myself, look, uh, the Bible isn't a science book. The Bible gives you the idea that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So there is some implication of a beginning. The earth wasn't here forever. It wasn't here eternally. There was a beginning. But the Bible makes no attempt to tell you the mechanisms of that. Uh, and there's no problem in describing those mechanisms in, in purely physical terms, uh, while at the same time saying that there's a compatibility with the biblical account of creation. And similarly, with regard to how, you know, the, how life forms and all their fantastic multiplicity appeared uh, and how one life form gives rise to another, the Bible doesn't really get into the details of it. It basically attributes it to God. But it's not just a God who sort of begins the process, but it's, it's a God that is sort of transcendent transcendentally, you may say, overseeing the process, that the process in, is in some mystical way dependent upon uh, the creator that put 
this whole mechanism into place. So I think that's, that is mainstream Christianity as I understand it. And it seems to me that is fully compatible with evolution. Now, admittedly, you know, when, the, when evolution first came about, just as when the Big Bang first came about, you're like, whoa, I didn't think of it, it would happen that way, uh, just based upon a reading of the Bible. But then upon reflection, you realize, wait a minute, I don't really see the two as clashing with each other at all. In other words, it, it would be pretty impressive for God to make every creature independently. It is equally impressive of God to create, you may call it a factory, <laughs> for making uh, living beings, all of whom share the same genetic material, so that the one transforms over time through the other. I mean, there's a kind of beautiful, um, kind of um, uh, uh, beautiful symmetry, if you will, to the whole process that Darwin himself commented on, the kind of wonder of evolution. Yeah, I would say there's not necessarily a conflict there. If you want to say that, um, so if, if your idea of the complexities of like the process of evolution, uh, the DNA, the systems of inheritance, um, you and a lot of people would say that, you know, that was the product of uh, an intelligent mind or something like that. Um, you know, that's that's an idea. It's not uh, it's not a belief that I I myself hold. I think that in, in principle, we could potentially explain these with naturalistic causes. But purely the idea, the notion that perhaps uh, they were the system was designed in some way by uh, a supernatural agent or a mind doesn't necessarily conflict with the fact that, well, however it got here, naturalistic or through an intelligent uh, being, this is what we have. This is this is what what the system is this is these are the facts of the of the matter um this is how evolution proceeds these are what genes are this is how transcription happens um and you yeah you can and you can believe uh or, or accept all the uh ideas of evolution and and look at the uh the way things evolved and the the relationships between organisms and you can you can take that at face value too um so i don't think there's necessarily a conflict there uh, I, I would just as a scientist maintain sort of a level of agnosticism towards uh you know the types of uh origin that created these uh the system of evolution and the rules per se um but i don't think they're necessarily incompatible if, if that's what you're asking yeah let's let me push you even further on this and talk briefly about adam and eve because um because my view about the um uh, about adam and eve is 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 sort of this uh, and that is that there is an attempt here to account for just what we talked about a few minutes ago, which is how does morality fit into the human picture? Because you've got this, this sort of uncomfortable reality of our nature that is built into us, and it needs to have some kind of account. As you said, evolution itself is struggling to give a full account of morality. So the, the, the story of Adam and Eve is, a, is a, an attempt to do that. It's sort of like, okay, you have, you've got, you know, you've got um, some ape-like creature that is transitioning over time uh, to, you know, homo sapiens uh, and obviously at some point that transition occurs right and you have man in the in the modern sense so we understand man uh, with a moral faculty and the distinguishing feature of this moral faculty is that on the one hand it is a very powerful voice but on the other hand it is a voice that we are sort of in rebellion against uh, in other words, we we don't want to do it. We wouldn't need the voice if we if our nature was such that we always conformed automatically, you know, to moral strictures. And and so the Adam and Eve story accounts for this in terms of God saying to Adam and Eve, it's kind of the, the the first human, whether an actual human, a hypothetical human. I mean, I think that's not the important thing. The important thing is that there is a moral instruction: don't do this, right? And it is in the nature of man to go, yeah, but I need to do it my own way. I want to, the, the apple looks good, it's very tasty, it's very appealing. So in other words, human desire is going to pull in a direction different from moral command. Um, and, and to me, this is a kind of very vivid illustration of not just the origin of man, but something that we kind of all live with every day, uh, namely this kind of incompatibility between the moral voice within us and human desire, 
you know, pulling like wild horses in many uh, different directions. Is that a way of framing the story that makes you as a biologist uncomfortable or does it or is it not incompatible with anything we've been talking about? I'm not uncomfortable with anything you said. I, I think that's probably the best way to interpret these types of stories as just being imbued with a lot of wisdom of our species, of uh, of the knowledge that we've accumulated through our experience. They tell an interesting story. They can be interpreted in, in many different ways, but I think that there are there are ways to interpret them that are very deep, that are very uh, beneficial, uh, that are extremely wise. And this is the realm that I think that religion should be trying to analyze these types of biblical stories, um, because I, I think it does both science and religion dirty when you take this autistic literal approach to, you know, the, God created a literal two humans in the past, and those literally gave rise to all of humans, uh, you know, through uh, what would have been a tremendous amount of inbreeding, you know, th that wouldn't be the way I would want to interpret these stories. Um, and that just the way you wouldn't interpret like a lot of Aesop's fables or something, you know, we wouldn't want to interpret something like the the scorpion and the frog story as like a literal a series of events that happened. This is something that is a a simple story that is imbued with so much meaning and it can interpret it different ways at different times and uh it, it says real things uh, it, it's imbued with a lot of real wisdom about our species that require us to reflect upon them and, and think about them very deeply so i think that's the realm that these types of stories need to be couched in i think i think you had it uh, almost exactly right the way we should be looking at these stories Colin, we've only begun to scratch the surface on a huge topic, but um, but we'll leave it here. Uh, we'll leave it here for now. Uh, thank you so much for joining me, guys. I've been talking to Dr. Colin Wright, Manhattan Institute Fellow. Really interesting discussion on evolution and also the relationship of evolution to theism and to morality. Colin, uh, a great pleasure. Thank you so much. It was a lot of fun. Subscribe to the Dinesh D'Souza podcast on Apple, Google, and Spotify, or watch on Rumble, YouTube, and SalemNow.com.